Hello, it's the captain of Fishbait Marketing, Rick Jones, coming to you once again from the bridge. We're going to talk some more today about marketing to fans. And we'll hear from a guy who really knows something about creating great fan experiences, my good friend Vince Thompson of Melt Sports Entertainment and Culinary in Atlanta, plus the Tuesday tip and another On the Road with Rick. It's going to be a great show, so let's cast off. Last week, we talked about my made-up Georgia Tech fan, Joe. We talked about his fan journey and the lifetime value he provided as a fan of Georgia Tech. I want to go a little deeper today and talk about what Tech or any other school or any other team or organization can do to nurture fan value. Now, we mentioned last week the need to grab fans at an early stage, And at an early age, studies have shown that children who are exposed to teams before age six are more likely to become fans of those teams. So let's talk about some of the things that you could do with these young fans. One thing they could do is do what Disney does. Disney will give you out a button that says, my first Disney trip. So how about a team saying, my first Auburn game, a big button? And maybe you even recognize those first-time fans on the electronic scoreboard. There's nothing that a five- or six-year-old would like better than to see their name on a scoreboard and being thanked. Or maybe even better, how about bringing them down onto the football field or onto the arena floor before the game? Talk about creating a memory. I'd like you to think about ways to make mom or dad the hero at your games for their kids. What kinds of things can we create that dad or mom can bring their child to that really builds great collective memories for both parties. Then we need to think about how we can continue to make games cool for preteens and teens. You know, maybe we can give preteens pregame tours of the locker room. You know, you, you can't do certain things to teenagers because they're considered recruitable athletes, but preteens, you know, that are ready to do things that are not baby stuff, um, could do things like locker room tours. But for teens, we could create a special seating area for teens near the student section where they could be exposed to the game in a different way and not have to sit with their parents. Because when you're a teenager, sitting with your parents at games isn't very cool. Now, once we have students on campus, how do we make attending games memorable for those members of the student body? And let's face it, today's students are different than my generation's. Today's students have a plethora of activities at their disposal. So we've got to figure out a way to re-engineer their game day experience. And we need to re-engineer it, you know, beyond alcohol consumption. Uh, But at the same time, I think we need to think about alcohol. Uh, If you're of legal drinking age, you should be able to buy a beer in your stadium. All kinds of studies have shown that having The sale of alcoholic beverages in your stadium prevents binge drinking pregame. It also prevents people from smuggling in flasks of alcohol. And so there's a way to create that balance. Uh, And so, you know, let's face it, for a college student, beer and alcohol is a part of that experience. And we need to find ways to make it relevant and yet make it safe and legal. We also have a tendency today to separate the student athletes from the students in so many ways. Student athletes live in their own dorms. They have their own training tables. They have their own schedules. And so are they part of the student body at some schools like Notre Dame and Duke? Yes. But at many other schools, they're really not. So how do do we help bridge that gap? One easy suggestion is to each week ask your football or your basketball players to stand up in their classes and invite their fellow students to their games. Stand up and say, hey, we play Alabama this week, and we really need you in the stands, and I would consider it a personal favor if you'd come out and support us. Now you're looking more like part of the student body. Uh, I also think we have to regularly ask students what they want from their game day experience. And let them design their own experiences. You know, we we shouldn't always pre-program everything because we may not know what they want as part of that. For millennials and Gen Zers, we also need to re-engineer their experience. So once you are a young 
alumni, you're looking for a different experience. I call the young alums what I, the appetizer generation. They want to taste a little football. They want to taste a little food and beverage. And they want to have little small visits with friends. I know this. They don't want to sit in seats. They want to move around and surf the experience. And so you're going to have to take out seats and build platforms with gourmet food and signature cocktails and craft beers and other experiences for these young adult fans. Plus, we're going to need to invest in in-stadium and in-arena connectability because if you're, if you're not connecting to the world through their, sport, through their smartphones, then they're not coming. They live with their phones, and it's not our fault if they can't get connected. And if they can't, they're going to leave. That's going to create, you know, funding uh, problems. I realize that. But uh, you're going to have to do that to keep them coming back. Now, how about those young alums with small children? We're recommending creating game day daycare. Uh, you can have bonded daycare. It could be maybe even managed by the early childhood development majors at the university. In that daycare, you can have mascot appearances, coloring books, activities for kids. And this will make a young mom happy and content as she gets to visit with her friends and enjoy the game knowing that her child's in a safe and fun environment. In a few weeks, we'll talk some more about creating value for Gen Xers and baby boomers. Now it's time for the Tuesday tip. I'm constantly amazed at how bad the fan interactives are at many college football fan fest. And the reason they're bad is they don't realize that fan fest are about fans. Are we bringing value to fans? And we need to change the experience each and every week or they're not coming back. I actually had a school tell me recently they didn't like one-offs. And I almost laughed in their face because you need one-offs every week because you need to change the experience. If you have seven home games and you have a fan fest and the experience never changes, why would I come back after doing it the first game? If you want to add more value to those that are there week in and week out, you need to make sure that you bring plenty of one-offs that generate new traffic. Now, we run a great tour for Dollar General called the Dollar General ESPN Events Tailgate Tour. And what we do is we create what we call a nine-minute experience, and it's all about the fan. They're only going to stop by for a maximum of nine minutes. And in that nine minutes, they're going to take a picture of the helmet of their favorite team. Uh, They're going to post that picture on social media for a chance to win that helmet. They're going to taste some barbecue cooked by a Kansas City barbecue celebrity chef. Free samples. Everybody loves food. They're going to play some ring toss, and they're going to play some tailgate toss for prizes. Uh, And then they're going to hit the road and move on. Because here's the deal. They're not there for our interactive. They're there to go to the football game. And so we know we've got just a moment to grab them. And we've got to have something for all ages. If they've got a little boy or little girl, it's got to be something they can do. If they've got their dad with them or their grandmother with them, there's got to be something for him or her to do. Because it's not about Dollar General. It's about what Dollar General can give to the fans. And that's your Tuesday tip. My guest today is Vince Thompson, CEO of Atlanta-based agency Melt. Vince is a native of Chatham, Alabama, and a proud graduate of Auburn University. And I know he's uh, struggling with the fact that his brilliant son, Carter, will be a freshman on a Hope Scholarship at Georgia this fall and not be in Auburn, so he's probably going through some sort of withdrawal symptoms. I want to say this about Vince. He's simply a creative genius. He's created so many unique experiences, and I cannot wait to dive into our discussion. So let's welcome a -a one-of-a-kind legend, my pal, Vince Thompson, to the bridge. Vince War Eagle, my friend, great to have you here from the bridge. 
I'm honored. I'm honored, Captain. Good morning. I wish I was actually up there um, on the bridge uh, with you. I'm overlooking all these big buildings in Atlanta, but I'd rather have your view than mine. Yeah, my view is pretty nice, and uh, we actually are having a beautiful uh, kind of a mild morning here in Charleston. It's not as hot and sticky as it normally is, but uh, – in my introduction to you today, I call you a creative genius, and I mean that. You're, you're one of the most creative people on the planet. No, but you are. And we've had so much fun over the years doing. If I look back and looked at some of the things we've done together, I just had to laugh at the diversity of the creativity. But, you know, for you, it all started down there in Chatham, Alabama, uh, and then, you know, you grow up in a small town in Alabama, you come to Auburn, and I guess David Housel was probably your first mentor there. And, and t- talk about him and, hey, what, not only what he meant to you, but w- what I think he meant to Auburn. Well, he, he was, um, you know, it was a life changer. Uh, you know, I grew up, as we like, you know, people ask me where I'm from, I go, I'm from L.A., which is obviously lower Alabama, the real L.A., uh, a very idyllic, uh, almost Mayberry-esque existence. Uh, you know, you, you need to be home at dark. You rode your bicycle, you fished, and um, um, you didn't lock your doors. And it was just an amazing, amazing existence. And, and I went to, you know, when you grow up in Alabama, you only have one or two choices. You're going to Auburn or Alabama. And my folks said, uh, you're going to Auburn, which was pretty much my admissions process. And uh, <laughs> much unlike how it is uh, today, I, I tell my kids – uh, that I made 21 on the ACT, and they look at me like I'm almost illiterate. And <laughs> and so uh, I went to Auburn to be a sports writer um, and wanted to come back and, and write for the Mobile Press Register. Uh, Dennis Smitherman was a sports editor, and and I looked up to him. Um, a first encounter, my first journalism class um, guest lecturer was David Housel, who at the time was the sports information director at Auburn. And he talked about the sideline and the press box and the locker room and the practices. And, you know, this was the dawn of the Coach Dye era and Bo Jackson era and Charles Barkley era and Frank Thomas era. And, and I said, man, that sounds like something I would love to do. And after class, I wa- um, walked up to him and I said, I'd love to volunteer to work over there. And he told me to get over there that afternoon and uh, didn't look back. And it was a milestone, the exposure of me falling in love with the business um, he was also the, the the faculty editor of the Auburn Plainsman. Went on to uh, you know write hundreds of articles, and he was the house father at the Fiji House. And I had no concept of a fraternity other than the movie Animal House, and that wound up being a life changer as well because I met you know my lifelong friends. And so uh, that experience, and when they really say you know the Auburn family, uh, it really is the, the culture of the institution, the culture of the town. I think the, the composition of the of the demographics of the student body rooted in, you know, farming and and, and vet and and agricultural and all that. But uh, really, really got me on my uh, on my on my on my path. I owe a lot to David, and what and David is obviously the consummate Auburn man. He is the quintessential Auburn man. He personifies. Uh, a lot of what it means to, um, to, to, to go to Auburn. Well, then you left there and did you go right to Barry Huey? Was that the, the next I went place? To Birmingham yep. and, um, um, stumbled around a little bit and got very, very fortunate. I met a, uh, very successful ad man in Birmingham named Barry Huey, who had, uh, built a nice, uh, which was actually ahead of its time, a nice sports and entertainment firm of all places, Birmingham, Alabama. But but he focused on um, a lot of the outdoor recreation uh, marine industry. Uh, there were a lot of companies in Alabama, uh, Humminbird Depth Sounders, Mans Baits, um, you know, EBSCO Industries owned a lot. And he had built himself a pretty decent niche. And then he had a great a lot of great relationships uh, with the PGA Tour and with uh, NASCAR at the time, there was a big cluster of race car drivers in Hueytown, Alabama, suburb of, of Birmingham. Uh, Bobby Allison, Davey Allison, Neil Bonnet, um, Red Farmer, um, just some you know amazing icons and legends uh, of the business. And so um, I stumbled into this agency. They needed a, a, a person to write press releases, and, and I'm like – God, I'm going to get paid to go to fishing tournaments and golf tournaments and NASCAR races. I've, 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 I'm in, I'm in Nirvana here. And so, uh, 
Um, it was an amazing experience, which I think is when you and I first uh, we did we met we met down at Disney's uh, Walt Disney World and and uh, ESPN in those early days they they they'd broadcast anything and. Uh, you would created, uh, along with Nabisco Brands, this thing called Bass and Golf, Bass and Race. And that's where we had professional uh, bass fishermen with professional golfers, and they would reverse roles. And then we did the same thing with race car drivers. And Humminbird uh, was a big sponsor of that. And that's where we first met. And uh, and that was, uh, again, when I describe that to people, they go, you're making this up. No, no nobody, nobody showed golfers and, and bass fishermen driving go-karts. Oh, yeah, they did. <laughs> Way ahead of his time, and you remember – um, we had Dale Earnhardt down there. We had Jeff Gordon. I remember Jeff Gordon was 19 years old. We had him driving a go-kart, uh, through Disney and he just smoked all these guys. But, but the, the theory was, is that, is that Humminbird, their fishermen also loved to play golf and, uh, loved to, um, watch NASCAR. And at the time, you know, Disney was on, um, trying to promote, uh, their fishing and their marine life and, and the boating and all of that. Um, you obviously were involved with the R.J. Reynolds back in the, in the day, and, and it really all came together uh, through a, a professional golfer named Woody Blackburn who yeah. won um, the Disney Classic in the old days. They used to have a tour event down there. and um, you know, But unwittingly, we were all ahead of our time in the cross-pollination and the cross-marketing, and, and to your point – um, you could pitch anything to ESPN and then, and then back in the day, um, they'd televise it. And so I think, you know, if you look back, it really was not only a hell of a lot of fun, but it was really, really kind of, kind of pioneering in its, uh, in its nature. Well, we could spend a whole lot of time talking about the next step in your career, which was Hell South and Richard Scrooge, but I'm saving that for the mini series because uh, we 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 can't do that justice in a in a thing. So I'm going to switch immediately to, you know, through that, you know, understanding the relationship that you had with athletic trainers, that led you to kind of a breakthrough program with Powerade and uh, athletic trainers and coolers. Talk a little bit about how that came about. It's interesting. And, and when, I, when, I, when I talk to uh, a lot of students about career opportunities and career development, the thing that I tell them is that your path is going to be your path. And, you know, you got to turn it over. Uh, don't sweat it. Turn it over to a higher being. You know, these kids put um, so much pressure on themselves, a lot of pressure applied from the outside to, you know, perform and excel. And, 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 and I think sometimes it sort of takes away of the enjoyment of the collegiate experience and, 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 and leads me back to this point is that I did, um, spent seven years with Barry Huey, amazing seven years, um, had a, um, a, a, a interesting, uh, you know, encounter, with Richard Scrooge, who's a brilliant healthcare entrepreneur, founded Health South, built it into a four billion dollar sports medicine uh, organization. Through that, we had thousands of athletic trainers who also double as physical therapists, and so he was branding healthcare and Health South, uh, building a brand out of it. And these athletic trainers were ambassadors for the organization, all over thousands of them all over the country, and and so. Another interesting anecdote is one of the largest private independent Coca-Cola bottlers in the country is United Bottler in Birmingham. They now um, distribute in six contiguous southeastern states. And so um, Scrooge had an idea. He wanted to unite all of his 2000 facilities with one big bottling agreement. Uh, he also we had these athletic trainers who we thought were going to be a great source uh, for the Coca-Cola company. And as fate would have it, uh, we wound up uh, working a, a major deal with the bottlers, uh, took many, many months to negotiate. And all of our athletic trainers at the time served Gatorade because there was not a true formal competitor. Powerade, Coke was launching Powerade in the 96 Olympics, and we converted all of those athletic trainers. And so even in 1995 and 96, uh, the foundation was laid through this very unwitting uh, encounter 
with Coca-Cola, with the bottler, with Scrooge's Vision, with our athletic trainers, uh, and the 96 Olympics. And so it goes back to my point is that, you know, your path becomes your path. But that really, really fascinating. I spent six years there. But that really laid the foundation uh, for uh, for Melt, uh, was laid at the feet of HealthSouth, the Coca-Cola Company, United Bottler, uh, and the launch of the Powerade brand during the Olympics in Atlanta in 1996. Well, you moved to Atlanta and you start the agency. And, you know, one of your next projects with Coke was the Dasani Fest program, which has now become my Coke Fest. You know, I'm amazed at young people that say, well, of course they always had concerts at the Final Four. Uh, 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 no. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, unwittingly, and that's, you know, you and I have had three or four, five lifetimes together, um, which is a, 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 a either a, a testament uh, uh, to something, probably our stubbornness. But, uh, but one of the first big breaks, so, you know, I uh, was 37 years old, had a newborn, Carter, and um, – you know, I said to myself and, and, and Tracy, you know, my wife, I said, you know, if I'm ever going to dive in the deep end, it, it's got to be right now because as the child gets older, I'll become more risk averse. And so we made a decision to uproot our lives in Birmingham. I've been there 15 years, wonderful uh, family and friends and quality of life and um, started working out of the out of my home with a newborn. And people forget that 9-11 was a giant gut punch to the economy. So I had barely been in business uh, a year when this first wave hit, uh, but just kind of kept plowing through and being perseverant. Um, Got a call one day in 2002 from a gentleman named uh, Jim Dinkins. And Jim Dinkins um, had from Coca-Cola. It says, we've, we've just signed a major agreement with the NCAA. Uh, we need somebody to execute the coolers on the sideline. And I heard you're the cooler guy, which, uh, funny and oddly enough, I was the cooler guy because I had been working on some other power eight, you know, athletic training projects once I uh, moved over here and transitioned. And he said, well, what other things could and should we be doing? And at the time, we discovered that it wasn't going to be Powerade on the sideline because the majority of the schools in the in the in NCAA were still Gatorade. So it was going to be Dasani water. And the brand managers at the time, people forget only 15 years ago, bottled water was somewhat of an anonymous. You know, it, and it also the early adapters of bottled water was the were, were female the gender and demographics later on males adopted it and everybody else and so the brand said well we don't really know how our brand integrates into pure athletic competitions what would you do and i looked uh with jim and jeff cottrell who's you know, jim dinkins now the president of coke jeff cottrell cmo of coke and and his team and uh, we, we saw this gap on Sunday. So we developed a mantra of nothing to do at a Final Four, and it happened to be the first year in New Orleans. So we developed this mantra that the Coca-Cola company is going to own the off day and refresh the fans. And it was in New Orleans, on the banks of the Mississippi, all these amazing bands were right there. All these amazing restaurants that served Coca-Cola were right there. Uh, you were in the leadership of the NABC. What more could we do with the coaches to create content and programming? And uh, the first Dasani Fest was born in 2003. Um, a lot of people showed up, had a lot of fun. And that was the first big break that I had uh, in my agency uh, career. And also the first big break that I had with biggest client to coca-cola company and it you know it obviously if you look at where it is today uh in 2019 tens of thousands of people uh show up uh for this entertainment and and i could challenge that there was this was probably the first major entertainment activity that happened around any major sporting event because i don't even think the super bowl uh were doing the things that obviously they're doing now around that so in a sense, you know, me, you, Jim Dinkins, Jeff Cottrell, 
um, you know, a lot of people, you know, we took a lot of risks to make this uh, happen. And so it's uh, it's really, really fulfilling to see it um, continuing to bear fruit. We just finished activating our 17th Final Four in Minneapolis on behalf of the Coca-Cola company. And then obviously it's going to be fun with it being in Atlanta in two, in 2020. Well, I, I, yeah, I like to remind people that uh, people think the NCA is really innovative. They just take everybody's ideas. Um, the, the first Final Four was actually created by the National Association of Basketball Coaches in 1939, and they ran it in 39 and 40, and then the NCA bought it in 41. And clearly, y'all did this independently. You had to do it cooperatively, but you did it independently of the NCA. But now they've taken it and t- turned it into an entire weekend long music festival with Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So it's got to be gratifying for you to do that. You know, at the same time, we did a little project down in San Antonio where we did a coach's cook off with Dasani. And I think that was maybe the first. Uh, you know, big concept y'all had that connected food back to sport. And now you've really grown the Coke culinary platform. Talk a little bit about that. Well, we've been very, you know, very blessed. I mean, if you look at every sports occasion, uh, it's a moment of emotion. You remember where you were, the biggest play, you're tailgating with your friends and family, you're home gating with your friends and family. And, and obviously Coca-Cola has been a very important part of that, obviously, they were the first sponsor of the 1928, the longest Olympic sponsor, 1928. But if you look at the occasion, Coke is is always a part of that emotional connection. And so the obvious, excuse me, dropping off point was what strategy can we can we build linking the Coca Cola company's sponsorship of athletic and, and sporting events, the desire to share that experience with friends and family, and then any any market where there's a major sporting event going on, and, and, and Rick, you hit the nail on the head, San Antonio in 2004, we were like, you know, the, the, the sporting event is what it is, but what are these ancillary activities and opportunities where we can link the brands, we can link these great coaches, we can link great content and programming. We can link that into retail. And if you think about this, how far ahead this was, Rick, is that, you know, social media and these mobile and wireless devices were still, I mean, well, social media really didn't exist. And, you know, the, the devices were not as obviously, you know, high speed and sophisticated as they are now. And so I think one of the, 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 the common trends is that, you know, you and I have always been innovators and kind of ahead of the curve. And we've never been afraid to, to push that envelope and disrupt it. And what has happened now is that, with it, is that about 40 to 50 major sporting events that the Coca-Cola company sponsors, we go into that local market and we, and we work with their local bottlers to identify these emerging chefs to participate in the event. So we were just in Cleveland for uh, Major League Baseball All-Star. The chefs developed this beautiful mobile kitchen. All the Cleveland chefs come out and cook and they cook with the celebrities and and really add some context and texture to the event. We were just in Orlando with a lot of great chefs there with Major League Soccer. And so uh, we'll be out at uh, East Lake this week uh, at the Tour Championship with a lot of famous Atlanta chefs. So it really, really has, has evolved into um, a really, really good business for Melt, uh, the culinary and the chef space. And now food... Uh, and breaking bread is such a great connective tissue, uh, you know, community, gather around the dining table, breaking bread with your friends and family, uh, and then obviously uh, bringing in an ice cold Coke into that. Uh, it's We look at it as a, as a big, burgeoning, evergreen um, uh, business. And so, uh, again, if you look at you and I going back to 03 with the first Asani Fest and you look at 04 with the coaches' cook-off, uh, these ideas were so far ahead, uh, and it is really nice to see that you know they've been able to sustain themselves and really evolve and really kind of be in the sweet spot of what's going on, uh, you know, with consumer trends. Well, speaking of new things, you, you, you're about to launch something that I think, again, I, I just and, and continue to be amazed at, at your innovation. But this thing you're doing with Aflac 
uh, and the Southeastern Conference, um, I, I think is one of the really, really big ideas that I've seen. You know, and it's one of those, well, duh, I should have had a V8, of course. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, you and I have a mantra that, you know, some of the biggest and best ideas are the most obvious. And so um, one of the benefits, we've represented the Coca-Cola company now for 19 years. And um, one of the benefits of, 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 of having that relationship for that long is that a lot of their marketers go to other major corporations and assume the CMO role. And uh, as fate would have, and we've got multiple clients, you know, Wingstop, there's a former Coke exec, uh, Intercontinental Hotel Group, there's a former Coke exec there. Um, and um, a lady, ironically, uh, Shannon Watkins, who I had worked with on the Powerade brand for many years, um, went to Aflac about a year ago and assumed the, the marketing reins. And she called me up and she said, you know, we're looking at making a, a, a another dive into college athletics. We've got this very successful, um, you know, trivia, athletic trivia, but we want to expand a messaging and a strategy. And, and we, we firmly believe in, in, in the college athletics is the, is the, is the vehicle for that. And so, uh, but part of the challenge was, you know, what is the consumer proposition of Aflac in North America? Um, you know, because the, the trivia has been so successful, the Aflac duck has been so successful. How do you take that and really expand it into what is their business, you know, proposition to the consumer? And so we developed um, a, 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 a thematic or a tagline is that the road to recovery and the comeback um, is begins and is supplemented by Aflac. And the core business proposition of Aflac is, is supplemental insurance uh, that provides kind of a gap when something happens to you versus when your, um, your other insurance company pays your medical bills and all that. It's an amazing, amazing service. And based in Columbus, Georgia, you know, Mr. Dan Amos, University of Georgia grad, has a great love. Uh, for college football. And that thematic sort of just really hit the bullseye. And so the expansion of that uh, will be um, how do we integrate uh, against, you know, and, and not make it, uh, you're not going to really focus on the, the, the injury per se, but the, the road to recovery and the comeback really begins at that moment. And so we'll be chronicling a lot of those great emotional stories um, it'll link into uh, that whole recovery process. And so you'll see a lot of these fun graphics during the broadcast. You're going to see some really, really fun uh, television spots uh, featuring Coach, Coach Nick Saban, but it's not Coach Saban of Alabama. It's Coach Saban as one of the greatest recruiters um, of all time. And you're going to see some real, real funny uh, spots about um, from the recruiting hook uh, because obviously part of the strategy is to recruit new consumers into um, the AFLAC business proposition or family. So that was a big one we're very, very proud of. Uh, another blue chip company on the roster, uh, obviously very competitive to, to be able to secure these. And, and it was a very proud moment uh, for me and the agency to really, really you know, land AFLAC and also um, come up with a really, really great idea that I think is going to have a lot of legs, um, you know, for, you know, a long time, similar to the all state good hands, uh, or those types of things. Well, one of the other innovative things that y'all do every year is melt university where you bring in, you know, some just tremendous young people and you give them exposure to the business that they don't get in, in, in college. You don't get access to the, the speakers that you bring in. I've been blessed to have had a chance to come in and speak to those dynamic young people. Tell me about how you created it and how that's grown. Uh, it is such a tremendous program. Well, uh, thank you. It, it, it's really a labor of love and it's the uh, most fun thing that I do in my job. And it's the most fulfilling. And it really started sort of, you know, uh, as everything else you know, with me sort of as a fluke or haphazardly, my great love 
is to go to college campuses and talk to kids about uh, career development. Your path is your path, and I and I and I try to enlighten them that being on a college campus uh, is the greatest professional laboratory that they're ever going to be exposed to, and there's amazing career and relationship development opportunities all around them that they need to take advantage of. So for instance, I tell them that I literally met Paul Feinbaum when I was 20 years old, you know, driving him to, you know, back and forth to games and those types of things. And then, and then, you know, 30, 40 years later, he and I are still very dear friends and on the show and all that. But that was part of the relationship building process. So over time, as I was speaking on these campuses, I had a lot of kids start to come up to me and say, you know, hey, can I intern for you? And uh, we want to, you know, we want to be exposed to this. But I didn't want it to be a, a, a traditional intern program where the kids show up, and they're doing some filing and they're not going to get exposed to great people and, 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 and great marketing activities. And so over time, every year now, we get 300 resumes and I would take them all if I could. It's a tremendous summer program. We took 37 kids this summer. It's, it's an eight-week, very immersive program. And then the other thing that dawned on me is that really, really smart marketing people were coming in and out of my office every day, such as yourself. And everybody wants to do something to give back to these kids. And so we now have 50 speakers per summer, and uh, they are from all walks of the marketing and media and sports marketing world. So I'm exposing these kids to a lot of career disciplines that they may not have thought about. I'm helping them learn relationship building skills. And then they are required uh, to write a handwritten thank you note. Which they do, which they all do. Yep. Yeah. I mean, because I want to teach them old timey follow-up skills and relationship building skills. And then we only, we only hire entry-level employees out of that intern program, and so it allows our retention rate to be much higher than the industry average. And even if we don't hire them, I help place them in a lot of other uh, career opportunities. And so we've got kids all over the country that, you know, for the Broncos and the Bears and CAA and Endeavor and, you know, the Tour, PGA Tour – the BB&T Tennis, uh, Coca-Cola, Chick-fil-A, Home Depot, Turner, uh, Carter's you know, Children Wear. So it's just uh, – and you never know where one of those kids is going to wind up and, you know, where we might do business together one day. Well, and, and I think you're always known by your alumni association. The people that you help along the path, you never know when they're going to come back and, and help you or help somebody else that – that's important to you. I want to I want to close today, and I got to get you back on because we we haven't even scratched the surface. But I want to I want to ask you one more question. With all the success you've had and all the things you're doing, what drives you? What what makes you get up in the morning excited about what you do? Well, you know they say if you um, you love your job or your work, you'll never work a day in the life your your life. And I think what drives me is I'm so blessed. I'm still really honestly that little boy from Chatham. It never gets old being on that field, being on that sideline, you know, being in that stadium, being in that venue, you know, working with clients. And so um, it just, you know, what drives me every day is I want to be the best in, 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 uh, in the world, in my, in my craft, in my class. What drives me is I want to help and influence others. And you know, we've, we've been given an opportunity to help a lot of kids, and we do a lot of you know, pro bono cause-related work uh, in Atlanta. Uh, but I think you know, uh, just never taking it for granted and treating every day, each day as a gift. I, you know, like I said, I'm blessed to, to, to be doing what I wanted to do since I was eight years old. Uh, and, and I think excellence and, and helping um, you know, your fellow man and, and – but I'm hyper competitive. So, you know, it, 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 we're in a bit, you know, you and I are in a business where, you know, we don't get to eat unless we kill something. And so, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of adrenaline, uh, in our business, but, uh, I think it's, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just fun. Uh, and the great part about the business that you and I are in is sports is an evergreen industry and, um, it's never going to go away. So, you know, as long as that, as long as we've got that, you and I will probably be able to put food on our table. 
Well, that's great. We appreciate the time that you spent with us today. That's my pal Vince Thompson from Melt coming to you from the bridge. It's time to get on the road with Rick. I've been traveling for both work and pleasure for the past few weeks, and I'm glad to finally be home for a few days. So it's time to visit one of my favorite places in Charleston, Justine's Kitchen. My good friend Data Berlin owns and runs Justine's Kitchen, and it's named for an African-American woman that raised her. Dana's from a, an old Charleston Jewish family, and she was raised by an African-American woman named Justine. And she's reproduced Justine's recipes at her restaurant. They have a great location on Meeting Street downtown. Each day they have amazing blue plate specials with fabulous vegetables like black-eyed peas or fried okra or uh, squash casserole. But they also got uh, shrimp or oyster baskets. When you sit down, they bring you pickled cucumbers to start, plus a big old glass of sweet tea. But you need to save room for the best at the end, and that's their coconut cream pie. It's absolutely the best dessert I've ever had. On some days, Charlotte and I will just go by and she'll run in and get a couple of pieces of pie as a takeout. That's how good it is. So come see us in Charleston and we'll meet up at Justine's. That's another one for the books. We'll be back next week with another edition of From the Bridge.